Welcome to this fourth video segment highlighting this unique team teaching experiment. Moving from the past to the present, Professors Kaufman and Hassassian explain the promise and obstacles of the process that started with the Madrid Regional Peace Conference of 1991. More than two decades later, the gaps have narrowed between Palestinians and Israelis towards a two-state solution, but not enough, and the role of a third party, like President Obama, was still unclear at this time. You might like to get an update and detailed analysis. Please join the professors for this engaging class at the University of Maryland in College Park. Our lovely campus is minutes from Washington, D.C. For more information, contact Professor Eddie Kaufman. Uh, I will tell you, Oslo had a lot of problems. Regardless, it was a breakthrough, regardless of the achievements that we have discussed, but definitely it had certain problems. I would say that at least there were four uh, barriers to the Oslo peace process. And uh, that led to the failure, I would say. One is the economic imbalances between Israelis having such high living standards and productivity with that of the Palestinians in the occupied territories. Another barrier was structural barrier, where there were restrictions on Israeli economic policy, of Israeli economic policy on the West Bank and Gaza, which have put, you know, Israel to be, uh, or Palestine to be totally isolated and to be totally dependent and totally subservient to that of uh, Israeli economy. The third is communication and information inequities. If you, if you go to the West Bank and if you go to Israel, you can see the road infrastructures. One is like, uh, like the United States, the other is like uh, even Tijuana, Mexico now is much improved. I mean, in terms of uh, differences. Uh, of course, information and communication systems at the time were inadequate. Now it's a different story. The West Bank has developed, the infrastructure has developed, the information system, the communication systems have developed. Now we're talking about the Oslo process failing in the year 2000. And then you have the ideological barrier, which we dwelt, and now we've been discussing it, is the issue of Islam with modernity. How could we be compatible and consistent with Westernization, globalization, while fundamentalists are still carrying the notion of going back to the precepts of Islam and ruling by having an Islamic state? So there is there a major contradiction when it comes to ideology. I think two main issues resulted in, from the Oslo peace process. The constructive ambiguity did not work out. Things were not fleshed out in details. And because of the objective conditions, things, you know, did not work out. So constructive ambiguity did not work out. And the talk of a new Middle East was appealing, but to those who spoke the language of diplomacy. In other words, they did not concretize it on the ground by cashing on the dividends for people that peace is possible and peace is affecting our you know, daily life. What we have witnessed from 1993 to the year 2000, settlements doubled, settlers doubled, uh, more military checkpoints and the suicide bombings on the other side. So things were not easy. I mean, even with all the shortcomings of the Oslo peace process, we have seen other factors that really made it impossible for Oslo I mean, uh, to succeed. Uh, I think the entire process was predicated on the implementation of a time frame, and that uh, time frame demanded uh, more fulfillment in its part uh, to deal with it. And uh, unilateral decisions taken by Israel were time and again breaching the agreement on the timetable and that in itself, you know, did not really push forward. Uh, there were no external mechanisms of verification as to the implementation of the uh, agreements or, or ensuring any kinds of compliance, of compliance uh, from a dispute resolution perspective. Uh, too many of the issues in the Oslo peace process were varied and uh, and I would say, you know, 
open to interpretations, opposing interpretations, especially when the issue of territory settlements, you know, uh, came to the fore. Uh, I think that the issue of political violence on both sides was not managed and contrived by the leadership on both sides. And one important factor is that much of the Oslo process was devoid of any real public debate or involvement. The gaps between public opinion about the issues and the compromises necessary to reach those agreements remain too wide throughout the peace process. In other words, there was no institutionalization of public involvement. We did not take the Oslo agreement to referendum. We put it, we started, you know, implementing it, and, and, and that in itself, you know, made things worse. Above all, I think Oslo failed to create a culture of peace. It, uh, it did not, it also failed to embolden the integration of third sector, i.e. NGOs, on both sides. Uh, it did not, it failed also to create peace education on both sides. It failed also to create linkages of our civil societies on both sides. It failed to narrow the gulf of difference among the intellectuals and the professionals, and we have written an extensive article on, on why Oslo failed and the lessons to be learned. Uh, also left the sticky issues open-ended, like the issue of Jerusalem and refugees. Uh, also managed to create, as I said, constructive ambiguities around the permanent status issues. I think also failed to legitimize Palestinian national aspirations of creating a viable independent state. Oslo also did not manage to get us out of the cycle of war and peace, because we have witnessed, even within the seven years of the peace process, violence on both sides. The negotiations were stuck on the process and not on the mechanisms of implementation. We were stuck in the form and could not move, therefore, into the substance. We discussed generalities and failed to delve into the details, which are considered to be very imperative in any kind of a solution. We already talked about the obstacles and the what went wrong. And there is an entire book uh, we want to share. I wrote a chapter myself too. We'll bring it uh, Tuesday also. But I would say, if I look at the big picture, not su such an elaborated answer, we call it uh, a sense of relative deprivation on both sides. What do I mean relative deprivation? It's the term that was coined by the Robert professor Sinclair. whose library is called after him, where we are sitting. Is somewhere in the picture there, Robert Gerr. Here's the situation. There is a euphoria at the beginning of peace. I have the figures overwhelming in both societies support to the Oslo process at the beginning. The expectations are rising. Palestinians talk about the peace dividends. Where are the peace dividends? The Israelis talk about what? You can guess. Security. Okay, you say that. <laughs> expectations of security are rising. Expectation, expectations of economic uh, development are rising on both sides. I mean, and what happens? The reality on the terrain, because of the spoilers, suicide bombing, and also because the obstacles that Israel is putting, including uh, economic, military, are going down. So people say, we were better off before Oslo, we were better off. So the gap between the rising expectations and the reality, that was the failure of the Oslo process. And the people were not socialized into the idea that there are spoilers, there are going to be spoilers. They should have said time and again and again and again. This is not going to be easy because there will be spoilers. And we have to be, you know, we have to see 
the light at the end of the tunnel. Like we have a joke in my in our office about the, there is no light in the end of the tunnel because of budgetary constraints. So you know. Now we have we coined another one. <laughs> well, there is no light at the end of the tunnel because there is no tunnel to start with. <laughs> So here's, I mean, people, I mean, they, they, there were different expectations about what's going to happen in between the beginning of euphoria and the end that will be a happy end, according, you know, it will be a, people thought it will be going up. We did not foresee they will go up and down, which is also the case was in Northern Ireland and things like that. So there was a disillusion. The Israelis said, we gave them a lot of territory. Well, the Israelis don't say territory. They say 98% of the Palestinians were under the Palestinian Authority. But only 42% of the territory was under the Palestinian Authority. I'm adding the other but side. The majority of the population are in the major cities. In the major cities. So 98%. Okay. So we, they are now 98% under the Palestinian Authority. And look what they are doing to us. Instead of more security, less security. Palestinians are saying, we finally accepted Israel on 78% of the historic Palestine. We are only asking for 22. Look what they are doing with the settlement. They are killing the peace process. So, and, you know, the two things happen to be quite true. I mean, it's not a... a so how do you deal with that? And the, 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 the failure to, you know, you need to convince the people. The idea that you can only do... I mean, what my friend is saying, okay, you have a confidential uh, negotiations and eventually to a referendum, but he's, you are going to lose a referendum if you don't prepare the people over time, over time. And that was not what happened.